Hello, and welcome to the Gilbo Girls Show, where you will have the opportunity to hear from mothers, fathers, siblings, and individuals themselves about their journey of living with a disability. I know, I know, it's called Gilbo Girls, but we have a bonus for you as we get the Gilbo Boys to interview some of the dads and siblings and get their perspectives too. We'll also have special guests from time to time to share the many resources that are available to those living with a disability and their families. So get ready to laugh, smile, cry, maybe even get a little angry when you hear some of these stories of their day-to-day struggles. But let's not forget their many triumphs. As they say, it takes a village. And if it weren't for our village, we wouldn't be where we are today. So join us. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Gilbo Girl Show. I'm your host, Karen Gilbo, and today's guest is Kendra I'm going I don't even want to butcher it. Can you say it? Gottsleben. Gottsleben. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. So Kendra is the marketing communication specialist at the Center for Disabilities at the University of South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She's an author and spokesperson on living a life with a rare disease and disability. Kendra is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization Rare by Design. She is an Augustana, Augustana University graduate with a double major in sociology and psychology. Her career blends the two worlds in which she grew up, which was medicine and education. Kendra's memberships on numerous boards, advisory groups, and professional societies keeps her activity engaged locally, statewide, and nationally. She's defined her life by a positive outlook and success in overcoming obstacles. Kendra refuses to be defined by MPS. Can you pronounce? Roger is mucopolysaccharidosis. Okay, so and, and MPS for short. Okay, yep. so the rare genetic condition she has, she's had since birth. Kendra enjoys a stylish outfit and shoes to match as she strives to make a difference. One of her favorite colors is yellow, which embodies her life motto. When life hands you lemons, make the best lemonade possible. Love that. So we got to meet Kendra back in 2016 at the first ever Runway of Dreams fashion show, kicking off the Tommy Hilfiger uh, first ever adaptive line. Um, It was a long day, but it was amazing. And we got to spend, we actually got to spend a lot of time with you and got to know you very well, um, along with some of the other uh, models. So it was a great day. Um, And then we got to see her again at two other shows. And we've just always kept in touch. So I really wanted to have her on the show. So welcome, Kendra. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You've been doing real, really good with all of your podcasts. I always been so fun to listen to and watch. Well, thank you. And then just another little fact too. Um, when, so I used to work for the ARC Northern Chesapeake region and one of my coworkers was sitting here talking and, and she was talking about a friend that was in the fashion show and lo and behold, it was Kendra. And I think that is just so crazy that Leslie and you were together. And then Leslie came here and worked at the ARC. And now she's, you know, at the state at DDA. And I'm actually going to be interviewing her as well. Yeah, so. it's a small world when you think about that. You know? Really? Because we're, you know, we're in South Dakota and Leslie's from South Dakota. And she was working with me and then got the job out there. So, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's fun to see how those uh, connections happen too, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, you, you think South Dakota, Maryland, like, there's yeah. a difference there, but yeah. it's cool. Yeah. So let's dive in. Can you share with us in more detail about what MPS is and how it affects you? And just say it one more time, too. So the broad term is mucopolysaccharidosis. Okay. And so... <clears throat> And then the MPS sits, it's called Martolome. So there's several different types within the MPS family. Okay. Type six. And so how we describe MPS is I am missing the enzyme that is needed to go in and cleanse my cells. So with that, without that enzyme, my cells build up with a gluey like substance so when you break down muco polysaccharide muco is that build up it's that mucus type stuff 
sugar, saccharide, many, poly. So for me, it affects um, heart, <clears throat> eyes, connective tissue, uh, other vital organs. But for some others, uh, it can affect those too. But uh, for like MPS4, they're more flexible. So, you know, mine constrict my muscles, the connective tissue. Okay. So each kind of condition overly affects all of our connective or all of our organs and everything, but there are some little differences in each type. Okay. And can you share with us what it was like growing up? Um, and I know this is like a biggie here it covers a lot, but cause you've had many from your surgeries, then, you know, to your friendships, school life, and then even some of your hobbies growing up. Yeah. So I've been really lucky and blessed that for someone who's rare. So NPS is a rare condition. So we're uh, in the rare space, but we're also in the disability space that I've only had maybe 20, 21 surgeries. And, you know, for people with disabilities or with rare diseases, that's not, that's not a very big number, you know, because um, I guess in my opinion, I don't think that is a ton. But so as a kid, um, I'm three feet tall right now. So I've always been short. And that is due to uh, MPS. Not everyone that has MPS type six is a small, but other is a good majority that are. But I was very lucky too as a kid with friendships. Um, I grew up uh, live in Sioux Falls, like you mentioned today, but I grew up in a smaller town um, called Vermilion, South Dakota. And so it was a small town, but the community you know, it was just amazing. It was a university town too. Mm -hmm. So it had that college aspect of it. And so when I was in grade school from kindergarten, preschool to fifth grade, I lived with about 20 kids, you know, so they grew up with me because I went to the private school. I wasn't going to the public school. Okay. So we kind of grew up together mm -hmm. and I think they knew I was different to a certain degree because I was a shorter, but you know, when we were that little, I wasn't like substantially shorter. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of hit when uh, fourth grade and everybody came back from fifth grade, everybody kind of shot up and I just kind of stayed mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we left uh, the private school and we entered the middle school, it was, it was nerve wracking because I was meeting, you know, so many more students. I didn't know how they would react. I mean, I knew I was different, but not probably to the extent. How so, I, were you very social and outgoing or were you more quiet and um, introverted? With people that I know, and people that I'm really good friends with, I'm outgoing. Going. But um, I would say I'm a extrovert introvert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I get it. I'm, I hear not, you. <laughs> I'm not really I'm not one of those people that just goes up and is like, hi, my name's Kendra. What's your name? Right, right. So that was nerve wrecking. And uh, the middle school was a lot bigger. And so trying to figure out, um, how I was going to get around because I didn't use a wheelchair in elementary. I mean, walking was hard, but I was very much um, kind of able to get around because it wasn't super right, the long. classes were probably just, closer together. You didn't switch around yeah. as much. Yeah. And the majority of it, like you were in one class, but if you went to PE, you went to the gym, lunch. Or, yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't a lot of like walking. But then, you know, when you go to middle school, every class is at a different place. So um, the school provided, and I always call it, 
like a chair out of the 70s. It was like burnt orange. Uh-huh. And it was basically a chair on wheels. I would not say it's a wheel <laughs> there. I really wish I would have taken a picture of it because, like, you know, I think people would be like, really, that is. An yeah, interesting- to see how far things have come, too. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah. And so it wasn't powered. I had to be pushed. But looking back, I feel like that was also a. Uh, blessing in disguise because I didn't have all the friends that I had in my you know elementary in each class Mm -hmm. so I had to you know kind of find people that could push me to like the to the next class and so in doing so I kind of met new people Mm -hmm. and I kind of became friends with them you know so it was kind of an avenue for meeting others and getting to know them. And so middle school, you know, I kind of, I get dropped off to school by my parents. And since the chair wasn't powered, I just kind of would sit right by my first period class and just sit there and wait. Cause it was like, I couldn't really walk around that much and I wasn't gonna nab. <laughs> One of my friends would be like, hey, push me to wherever you're going. <laughs> and also, I've also been a person that I don't pity myself, but I'm also realistic right. in the aspect of um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the same age as many of them. But I think when you've had surgeries and you've had doctor visits all the time, you grow up a little faster. Mm -hmm. And so I was realistic in the aspect of my friends are not going to come over all the time, shit with me until school starts, push me around. You know, I just, I didn't expect that that. because Mm -hmm. that was just unrealistic. Not that they didn't at times, but I just knew it was not going to be an everyday thing. Right. And faith goes through that too. Yeah. Yeah, I could totally get it. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think that means your friends, you're not as good of friends as you are. But I think uh, you also have to realize that their journey is different than ours. Mm-hmm. So you can't expect something that they wouldn't possibly uh, know. Yeah. You know, it, it's not a dig towards you. Right, exactly. So then when I left middle school, uh, we finally realized, uh, okay, we probably need a wheelchair. So as a freshman, is the first time I got a legit like wheelchair. And that was challenging mentally because we, my mom and I very much thought like, okay, if we're caving in and saying, we need a wheelchair, that it means like I'm never gonna walk again, which was the stupidest thinking. Now that we all do it because I did the same thing with Faith, pushed off that wheelchair so for so long. And I'm like, well, realistically she needs it for these longer distances. It doesn't mean she can't. So no, I hear you, I get you, I feel you. So yes. Because once I got that wheelchair, I got so, much more independent. Mm-hmm. And, and I, then there's also that fine line of you don't want to become too independent of it because you still want to get up and do those things. Otherwise you're going to get like atro- muscle atrophy and then yeah. you're going to stay in there. So there's also, there are some people that once they go in, they don't get back out, but it's be- because then they're relying on it too much. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to say that too. No, it is. And yeah. that is, I think that you don't realize that. But then when I did that, I was like, Because like mom and I would go shopping or we would do stuff. And before we would use like um, strollers, Mm -hmm. I would use strollers. And those were always like, we tried to find the one that looked less Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm baby-like, you know, but then my mom would walk off and forget to like push me over there, you know, so, (laughs) you know, but then with the wheelchair, it was like, hey, I'm going to go look at this 
and I'll come back while you're looking at this. You know, so it was things like that that we mm-hmm. never really yeah gave you more independence. Had thought about yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and so I was nervous about coming to school with it, but again, it was a hit. Everybody was like, you know, because there was kind of that like back end of it. There were some guys who were like, hey, can I jump on it? And you grab it. I'm like, well, there was a really short kid in my class. I'm like, you can. <laughs> like, You're too tall. <laughs> you know, but it was it was also another way to um, have conversations. Conversations that connect, yeah. But I was, you know, it was scary too just because I was the only person in um, Vermilion High School at the time that used a wheelchair, Mm -hmm. you know, but I was very lucky. I never, I've been often asked, like, were you made fun of? Were you bullied? Mm -hmm. And again, I'm realistic. And I say, I'm not saying that I wasn't behind my back, Back. Mm -hmm. but to my face, no, no. I mean, there might've been some, odd comments that I'm like what are what are you saying you know mm-hmm. but I never really took it as a bully remark I took it as that's a stupid comment right mm-hmm. you exactly. know and mm-hmm. they don't know you don't know what you don't know too yeah, yeah. and people say things that's just and kids are way. kids and it's yeah sad but true yeah so I mean I was very lucky you know, with my growing up years, uh, uh, for the most part, I don't have a lot of um, ideas of or remembering people saying mean things. You know, there were instances during school where I did have, um, not a ton, but like in Vermilion School, that teachers uh, or guidance counselors kind of questioning my ability Mm -hmm. because I was mainstream I was on a 504 Mm -hmm. so I was with everybody else and so we had I took an AP class and what that one teacher for the literature part you know she had (laughs) had someone with a disability in her class and um she was just didn't really know how to um, work with me or it was just, you could just tell she was kind of like awkward or whatever, yeah. you know, and, and I just, Not, really, she doesn't know. Right, right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And there's, there's also too, like, even, even with faith, you know, when she was going to regular school, you know, there was sometimes where they didn't, they didn't know how to teach her the proper way that she learned or, and didn't quite get it. But at the Maryland school for the blind, because she has the cortical vision impairment, they are trained and they know how, how to, to navigate that. Yeah. I know that's, it's different than yours, but it's in, in that oh. kind of same majority of like yeah. some of them, they know more, know, like, I don't, yeah, they're better equipped. Well, part of it is I think, you know, there's still that very common misconception of if you have a disability, they tend to always be in the resource room. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, they're not in the mainstream, mainstream. classes. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, my mom, uh, she has, She's retired from education, but she was a 504 coordinator, IEPs, and she was a principal administrator. So she had that background. Yeah. So she went into the teacher and was just saying, like, you know, she only needs accommodations. You know, she doesn't need modifications. You know, just ask her. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've always been an open book because I realized not only am I, you know, now in the wheelchair, but like not only am I in a wheelchair, but I'm little. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like sometimes that throws people even more because if you were a taller person in a wheelchair, not straight across the board, I'm saying in society, but there is that like, okay, wait, is she five in a wheelchair (laughs) or, you know, Mm -hmm. And so 
I'm I'm aware of that, and so I just if something happens, I I don't get distraught or thrown off track. Track right because of it, right? Yeah. And, and what kind of hobbies did you do? What did you do for fun? So I liked painting. Uh, I liked being with my friends, but uh, I wrote a lot. So when I was in fifth grade, we had a really good teacher that tur- uh, taught us, you know, all the rules of, you know, before everybody had computers, mm-hmm. <laughs> the handwriting of like how to edit, you know, draft one, and then you go through again and do draft two. Mm-hmm. We edited like our classmates. And so that's really kind of when writing became an outlet for me. And I wrote a lot of poetry, not rhyming poetry. I'm not that good at that. That's hard. (laughs) Writing is hard. Um, But, you know, that kind of with surgeries and uh, things like that, we had, we lost a classmate when we were in sixth grade. She went to the private school with us in that class so then when she we moved to the public school she um ended up passing away from leukemia and so you know that's that was tough but I wrote some poems you know about her she believed in angels and loved teddy bears and so those were some of the things that I wrote about you know so even at a young age Mm -hmm. Besides my issues, losing a classmate was challenging for our class. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When you've felt down and frustrated, uh, that brings us to, I mean, you had that writing outlet, but was there anything else that you like could do in the moment that kind of helped you get through? I was, I was very lucky that, um, that my mom was a person that she didn't hide stuff from me, but she also um, talked about, was comfortable talking about some of the tough issues. So Mm -hmm. like surgeries, like surgery has always been very scary because with our condition, intubating, the intubation process is almost more challenging than some of the tough surgeries we've had. We, uh, when we're trying to figure out some issues about from sixth to seventh grade, I was losing a lot of energy. I was losing a lot of, I couldn't really write anymore. I couldn't, That it was just, I was slowly going downhill. Mm-hmm. And so one of the surgeries, uh, someone had told us about, a man named Dr. Kopitz, who was at St. Joseph's in Maryland. So we flew out there for him to look at me, but he worked more specifically on little people. And I am little, but I don't have the anatomy of what little people have. And we really were trying to help him understand that. Um, But he said, oh, no, she's good. But um we went in to try to get my adenoids and tonsils out before having this other serious surgery and I coded twice. So, um, when we stressed with him that, you know, the intubation is extremely hard because we kind of have little nooks and crannies Mm -hmm. in our airway. And so, you know, that surgery didn't, work out. I still have my adenoids and I still have my tonsils, but I'm here. You're alive. <laughs> they said uh when they came out to my parents, they said she's alive. Uh we don't know how she is, but she is. And my mom just said it wasn't her time to go. Yep. You oh know. But then I'm I woke a- up and I was annoyed because I still had, had a sore them. throat. And I still have my adenoids and tonsils. <laughs> well, you say it's not a lot, but 21 surgeries is a lot. And what was your longest surgery? So my longest one was three years ago. 
during the COVID pandemic 2020. Yes, I remember. I remember. I had open heart surgery, and that was a nine hour surgery. And that surgery it was a long recovery, too. Yeah. And that surgery is at this point in my life, not saying there aren't going to be more surgeries, but at this point in my life, that was the hardest uh, surgery I've ever been through. A, because of recovery, but also the reality of the intubation. I'm older. You know, a lot of some of these surgeries were when I was younger, you know, and so it was mentally hard, physically hard. hard. And I would say it was physically and mentally hard for my mom, my parents too, Mm -hmm. because I knew, we knew I had to do it. But the reality is, and I don't like to be morbid, but mm-hmm. the reality is now that I'm, you know, older, when I was a little kid, I just always thought, you know, not that my parents didn't care, but I was like, I didn't understand the gravity yeah, of, it. of it. But as an adult, it becomes more because when I'm getting rolled away from my parents, I'm thinking how scared I am. Mm-hmm. But I'm realizing how scared they are because they're thinking, is this the last time I'm going to see her alive? Mm -hmm. That chokes me up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. Wow. Yeah. Because with this surgery too, I knew it was going to be a long process. Mm -hmm. The airway is a tough thing for me. Uh, You know, and my heart was pretty bad. So it was like, you know, and then there was talk of maybe needing a trach. And then that was hard because I felt like if I have a trach, then I lose more independence. You know, it was just a big, and then it was COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I talked about that. Yeah, which is even 10 times scarier. Yeah. So it was August, which we're coming up three years. August 13th was when I had surgery. So it was like you had all of that anxiety, but then you had, you know, if, uh, the COVID precautions where people couldn't come, mm-hmm. you know, and luckily and you're alone. Yeah. Cause you're over 18. So you can't have anybody. Cause weren't they just like letting, if you were under 18, you could have somebody. That was, but we got it. And I, we got it so that my, both my parents could be in there when I was having in the hospital, when I was having surgery. Okay. And then, um, because I have surgery in the kids hospital because I'm so complicated that's right yeah and so they did allow my mom to stay with me because I was in the hospital in the ICU for eight days and then I moved up to the um, regular floor for eight days so I was there a long time Mm -hmm. so you know we had a not like a I had gotten all the check, the boxes checked before surgery and everything with the, the team and everything. But then once we showed up, the message didn't get to the people. So we had to do a little bit of, uh, my mom had to get a little upset. That- <laughs> <laughs> Us and- moms, leave it to the moms and- when it comes to our kids. <laughs> yeah. And and what was hard for me too is I, I'm a, I'm an advocate for myself. I'm very mm-hmm. much like that's my mm-hmm. role. But when that went down right before I was, they were going to roll me into surgery, I started crying because I'm like, I had all of this stuff checked. I double checked, I triple checked. And at that point, I was like, I don't have the energy to like get this going. I'm just trying to keep myself Calm not and crazy and yeah. going into surgery. Yeah. And so, I mean, I knew my mom would take, but it was, it was also frustrating because I had all of that stuff mm-hmm. figured out, like checked, rechecked, but yeah. you know, that's just part of the, the world of hospitals this and doctors. This is true. So, yeah. So how would your college, how was your college experience as far as like, it was inclusive, the accessibility of getting around that kind of stuff? So there are two colleges here in Sioux Falls. That's why um, I moved to Sioux Falls to go to college. Uh, And they're both private. But the reason, so 
they both have very good reputations academic academically. Definitely. But when I toured them, luckily we toured them during winter. So we got like the full effect of like accessibility wise mm-hmm. or no removal and everything. Mm-hmm. And what really sold me well, for Augustana was every building on campus to get into the building had at least one push button. Okay. And then every building also had one set of bathroom doors that had push buttons. Mm. Yeah. And so this was 2004 or five, like I graduated in yeah, 2004. Yeah, kind of surprising back so then. So it was right? very surprising back then because then the outside doors, you know, that still was kind of like, oh, okay. But the buttons on the bathrooms was, oh, yeah. you know, and so because of independence and stuff, I didn't live on campus. Okay. So I knew also I was going to be on campus a lot. And so that was kind of key for me too, with, with all those um, sidewalks that were really good, uh, parking lots and all of that with the buttons. It was like, I wouldn't be struggling getting doors open mm-hmm. and stuff. You know, I hate saying it's like, it was, it's a very good school for academia, but yes, I kind of like, well, you have some good buttons. I really like <laughs> But it's instrumental, so you yeah. can get to those good academics. They need that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, again, I ran into, like, overall had a great experience. But again, I ran into some professors that didn't, probably hadn't had many people three foot in a wheelchair taking their classes. And so I ran into that freshman year. And so what I realized was from that point on, I emailed every professor before the next semester or whatever. And I said, hi, I'm Kendra Gottschleben. I'm three feet tall. I need a wheelchair. I'm going to be in your class. I'm an open book. Ask me any questions, you know. And that's how they learn. Yeah. And that was my way of. That's good. Trying to say like. Seriously, ask me questions. You know, I'm okay. And so every room that I had a class, I had a table on wheels, you know, because of my wheelchair. Um, Overall, I had really good uh, professors. I learned a lot. I rewrote a lot too there, which was great is it's a every every class, like even in math class, we wrote in science class, we wrote. So when I was ending my college career, uh, someone had asked if I ever thought about writing a book. And I said, yeah, someday, but I'm like, you know, I'm still kind of young. And somebody had said, no, I think you have a lot, (laughs) you have enough content to write something. And so this friend of mine, like, sent me like an outline and was like, here, here, here. And I was like, oh, okay. So what was nice is a lot of those papers, it was the liberal arts school. So a lot of some of the things that we wrote on were like reflective of we read something and how does that reflect your life or your experience or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so some of those assignments were where I started and just expounded on Mm -hmm. for my book. book. Yeah. So it really came in handy. So that goes us into the next thing. So you've written three books so far. Can you share a little bit about each one? And do you have any more in the works? My first book is Live, Laugh, Lemonade, A Journey of Choosing to Beat the Odds. And so that was kind of taking what I had said, those papers, and putting it into the book as a reflective piece. So if somebody were to ask like what what is it and I it's kind of an inspirational it's kind of a autobiography but a lot of it is it starts from when I was a kid about like when I was born and helping to talk about the journey to where I was 
at that point when I graduated and finished the book, Mm -hmm. because at first I was just going to write about like how I thought of things as a person with a disability, with a rare disease, what were my perspectives on situations and stuff. And I realized that when I talked about that, you needed to understand where I came from as a kid to have those ideas or that perspective at the age that I was at. Yes, that makes you know? a lot of sense. So I needed to kind of explain that. And so I added some poems that I had written when I was uh, in grade school, uh, some that I'd written in college, because I took creative writing at Augie, and uh, that was a good class. That was a good challenge for me, because they were doing the, you know, the real you know, mm-hmm. when you're writing, that's just like, just whatever you want to put on these, you right. know, the rules and stuff. Stuff, yeah. And then what and was then your second book? <clears throat> that second book was called Tender's Lemonade, and it was a kid's book. And so that was my way of taking the first book and trying to make it simpler, much simpler, you know, for kids mm-hmm. to understand how you know, we're all unique, we're, and that's okay, where I talked about the kids in, like, some of the kids in the images are, like, people from my class. Uh, we don't put names in there, but um, one of them is an example of, one of the pages talks about how I was really short, and I had a classmate that was really tall, which was very, which was true, he was very tall, and I just talk about how that's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with being different, you know, and it's also a teaching book in that aspect of parents could read it to their child. uh, Counselors could read it to their students because what I did was at not on all of the pages, but on some of the pages, we asked a question where like, what's unique about you? You know, so so it'd be kind of Mm -hmm. became a discussion Conversation and discussion book yeah. yeah and then you could realize somebody might say because you know how people wear glasses you know that's technically an assistive device but nobody thinks of it that way, that way. so like if a, a child in the classroom says i wear glasses you know what i mean it's, it's just that conversation of everybody has something unique about them in a classroom in society and that's what makes society great yeah so then after that so that was 2014 I self-published that one and then in 2019 that's when I I worked with a publisher and wrote uh, Kendra's Perfect Dance yep that's the one I have yep and so this one is more of a not really a teacher, like we didn't ask questions in it, but it's talking about, you know, how we have struggles. And like, I danced when I was a kid from fourth and third grade. And so that is, of course, Kendra is the character of me, where I talked about how I had a stool, Mm -hmm. because sometimes I needed to rest. So I had a stool in that class. And I talked about how it's hard to stretch my arms really tall because of you know I didn't use as big as words but like because of my constricted arms and stuff and sometimes I got tired and sometimes I got frustrated if I wasn't doing the moves the right way Mm -hmm. like everybody else in my Mm -hmm. class and I kind of felt sad and then we move forward and showing that you, you need to dance your own special way you know and that's okay because everybody has a, their own way of doing whatever they love to do or whatever they're trying to do in general. Yep. And of course, there is a lemon theme mm-hmm. in, in many of the books. So there's that because I live by the life or the quote of, you know, when life hands you lemons, make the best lemonade possible. And I put that special twist on it because possible means like 
you know, making the best lemonade is great, but as good as you can, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody has their way of making it as possible for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, For future books, I would like to write future books. But I just need to find time. Time to do it. Yeah, you are busy, which is going to lead us into a little bit of a, a few more things. Um, I do have to, I want to get your first two books. Okay. So, which brings us into your nonprofit called Rare by Design. So, if you can share with us what ultimately led and or inspired you to start that. So, what inspired me to start? where my design was, I, because I had attended the Runway of Dreams uh, first event and I was part of it, I, the excitement and the energy that the room had, Mm -hmm. A, as a model, but then just Mm -hmm. watching so many people who have never experienced being a model who had a disability yep. but also the people in the audience. audience it was just it was very hard to explain mm-hmm. the it's energy it was just like electrifying it was nerve-wracking but it was amazing and I just felt like someday I wanted to try to figure out a way to do something like this back in Sioux Falls South mm-hmm. Dakota and so that was, you know, that was 2016. So, you know, there was many years later, but I kept, I kept it in the back of my mind. And um, clothing has always been a passion of mine, but also seeing visual representation, you know, seeing people on the boardrooms or in the boardrooms, on commercials, like just seeing us as we are. And that's kind of where the books came from too, the kids books. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because when I was a kid, I didn't see a lot of characters that were like shorter mm-hmm. or had a disability or had a rare disease. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the same thing with Rare by Design is our mission is to celebrate the rare that makes us unique and extraordinary. And so it'd been a long time dream, but I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. And so my grandma passed away February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And I had told her about this dream of wanting to do some type of event in Sioux Falls where we have local boutiques lend us clothes and we have models of all types of people so that we could show what true diversity looks like. So we had people with disabilities, people without disabilities, people with um, different backgrounds, mm-hmm. you know, all of it. And because mm-hmm. also as people don't realize when you say the word diversity, people with disabilities are not often part of that conversation. Yeah. yeah. And so when I told my grandma that, she had said, uh, I know that you'll do it someday because you're you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, well, we'll see. <laughs> So my grandma had passed away in February of 2020, not too long after she had said that she was battling some heart issues too. And so then when I had my heart surgery and didn't know what, you know, wasn't guaranteed the outcome that it would be after surgery and waking up, would I wake up, would I not? Um, Not like immediately after, but maybe a couple of days after, I was like, I need to stop thinking about this and I need to put it into action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically how it started. I, you know, I let myself heal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then then I tried to kind of started networking and asking people like, how do how do you, have you ever done this? How do you do this? This is what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And one of my board members had her, uh, before I had created my board, uh, she also went to Augie and she had cystic fibrosis and she had started a nonprofit. And she had said, oh, yeah, I mean, I'll try to help you as much as I can. And she connected me to 
a really awesome lawyer in town and their firm donated the pre-work like to create mm -hmm. the 501c C, and it kind of stems from there so that was in 2021 we were officially official mm -hmm. march 31st 2021 That's and then kind of everything else is you know been history part of it too is you know you live on the east coast so you see more of it but it's also on the west coast so you do see those ads or you see also because of mindy's really amazing push with runway of dreams and stuff but you kind of see those things they start out in you know the west east coast and the west coast but the midwest sometimes it takes longer to get here mm -hmm. and so i really wanted rare by design to help facilitate Save that yeah mm -hmm. and see why it's so important you know so we are focused on people with rare disease and disabilities but also their family members with opportunities fun experiences but also trying to foster community engagement and helping them see a people with disabilities are valued society members they should be on boards they should be um, helping marketing firms when they're doing a commercial or, you know, just trying to realize that people with disabilities are involved everywhere. Mm -hmm. So get, get that visibility mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's a lot of it. And so you did have, so you did have your, had your first fashion show. Now, is that something that you plan to do every year or what kind of events are you planning? So we've done two of them. We did one, our first one in 2022. We just did our uh, second in 2023 and we just signed the contract to do, to do one in 2024. That is going to be kind of our fundraiser event. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a twofold where we're, fundraising, but it's also an experience for the models to have fun, but then also the audience members to see what true representation looks like. Looks like. And so this year uh, in uh, July, we did our first non, um, you know, runway show. We did a billboard campaign around town for Disability Pride Month. Mm -hmm. And we had five different ads that appeared throughout the whole month uh, with uh, all across town. And we had six, I believe we had six models uh, on the ads. And so that was kind of exciting because that was our first non-runway. Mm -hmm show and mm -hmm. we're working on our second event that's going to happen in October. It's going to be an art exhibit and it's going to be of individuals with physical disabilities and it's called Refocus mm -hmm. and we're wanting to help um, society to realize, you know, you don't judge a book by its cover. So, uh, you know, when you see someone in a wheelchair, you know, there is more to them than the wheelchair or if there's a limb difference, you know, or if they have Down syndrome, there's more to them. Yeah. And so we're really excited about that. We've partnered with another uh, organization here. They're called Untitled 10 and they do a lot of pop-up art shows. And so I reached out because I thought with their experience mm -hmm. of art shows and our experience would be a great partnership. and they signed on and they've been amazing. It's been fun to learn from them. And I think they've learned a lot from us. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a really fun project because of the collaboration that's come into it. That is awesome. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up um, or any advice that you would like to give? <clears throat> uh, the advice that I would like to give I guess is that 
for me, when I'm talking to young advocates or advocates in general, it's just realizing that, and many of all might know this, but just the aspect of when we understand our disability and when we own who we are, you know, when we have those days that are tough, that's okay. But realizing as, as soon as we accept who we are, what our limitations are, but what our strengths are, I believe the better off we are as a person and how we can, how we could offer so much to society. And I wish society would also see that, that there's great value in having focus groups with individuals with disabilities. Uh, there's great value of hiring people with disabilities because the bottom line is nobody understands everybody's journey. And that's okay. Like you can't expect to understand a person's journey if you've never been in a wheelchair. And that's where hiring people, that's why having focus groups for anything, an event, mm -hmm. a, a church committee or anything is, they have a different perspective than you would. You have a different perspective than they would. Oh, and that the reality is, if the society can just all come together and all the different perspectives are actually going to be beneficial in moving society forward in inclusiveness. I mean, I got a message from a friend of mine last night. Uh, her family went out to uh, the Sturgis rallies, which is on the other side of our state in South Dakota. And then her parents went to a restaurant that had push buttons on the outside, which that nowadays isn't as uncommon. But she said they also had push buttons on the bathrooms inside. inside. Really? Yeah. And so it's, it's that, that it's like not taking the ADA as a checklist, but going above. above yeah. I, I have to this day, have never even seen one like that with a. I, I've never seen it. I can say I have not seen a restaurant either. It doesn't. Doors on the outside of the building. Yes. Yes. But not. But, in, yeah. So cool. I mean, there is a perfect example that it's like it is 2023 mm -hmm. and our minds just got blown mm -hmm. <laughs> by push buttons at a restaurant on the bathroom doors mm -hmm. so i mean that's kind of sad too but yeah. mm -hmm. you know but i mean it's that we're realizing when we're building things when we're planning events and geez even i think of like faith when we go to go and it's like okay here you wash your hands but then you got to go all the way over there to get the paper towels or the thing okay so you got your wheelchair your walker like how you get in there you know yeah you just think there's so many things we think of that they just i don't I don't understand what they're, I don't understand what the people are who are coming up with these and these. I think ideas. a lot of it is they're going off the ADA and they say it's a checklist. And it's like the ADA isn't even adequate because it's so old. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 years is not that, 33 is not really that old. <laughs> but I mean, when you think about it, it hasn't been updated. And so instead of doing the bare minimum, try to make it welcoming mm -hmm. for anybody yep. that's the key yeah it's just welcoming for anybody that was coming mm -hmm. yeah and you know and 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 uh did do you have siblings no i do not you do not okay i wasn't sure if you did nope. okay so what brings us to what's your word so I hand stamp all of my guests as a token of appreciation from being on and sharing and being vulnerable, a hand stamp one letter at a time on a token word. So with that being said, would you be willing to share what word you chose and why? So I'm choosing the word imagine. And that is because I wrote a poem in I believe it was 2009 called Imagine. 
and it was all about imagine this, imagine that, where it's like, imagine you're three feet tall and in a wheelchair, but in a classroom filled with people that are much taller. Imagine you would like to be go on a date, but you've never been on a date. It was imagine, you know, it was that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it and um, a lot of, I just wrote it because I just wanted to. And it was seen by someone in, who was a pharm part of my pharmaceutical company that makes my medicine that I've been receiving um, weekly. I probably should have talked about that, but. Um, you still can. I can I break part, this up into two episodes. <laughs> I, was, I was part of a clinical research enzyme trial for, for my condition. And um, so I lived out in Oakland, California for uh, six months to be part of, to get the Naglazine, which it's called now, um, FDA approved. And so the company is called Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. And so at the beginning of it, you know, when they were a hundred people, <laughs> they're, you know, cause they were small and now they're much bigger. They kind of did little like newsletters that they printed out. And I don't remember how, but I don't know if I posted it somewhere or something, but I had put my poem from there and they had said, hey, can we share this? And so they put it there in their little newsletter. And then I was getting pictures of people like in their office that had it posted because they said it was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my first uh, poem that people really, I was very vulnerable in it. And I think, that's well, why. now you have to send it to me so I can attach it to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I was proud of it because, um, you know, but I, that's why I'm choosing Imagine because, uh, and then since then, like whenever my mom's shopping or when my grandma would be somewhere, if there was something that said Imagine, they pick it up. Stuff, then, uh huh. Yeah. You know, so it's just, and it kind of goes back to, the philosophy of how much I like live my life is that aspect of possibility, you know, staying positive. Imagine, like imagine what might be possible. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of been my other word that I live by too. Yeah, I love that. What, um, but then the very last thing is how can people find you? Do you have like one website that has everything on it, like your books and your nonprofit or are they like, how does one? No, find you? no. So each, so whereabydesign.org has its own website mm -hmm. and they on there has like all our social media channels for where by design. Okay. And then um, I have kendragotslavin.com that has all my books on there. Um, they are on Amazon too, and I have all my social media, social media handles for my personal on my website too. Okay, awesome, and I'll make sure that I put both of those in the um, the show notes as well. Well, I just can't thank you enough so much. Um, it was like so awesome to like just get to chill and hang out with you again and. Uh, well, good luck on editing. <laughs> so this is a great part of this. I basically there's nothing we need to edit because it's real life and we're having a conversation and sharing our stories. So I had the dog bark, but it wasn't enough for me to edit out. The, the, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be rude. I'm like, I'm texting my husband, let the dog out because the dog started whining at the door. And I'm like, I didn't like, I don't want to interrupt because you're like going so good and like telling good information. So I'm like, text him, let the dog out. I tell him if the dog comes in, that's fine, but make sure just leave the door the way it is. Don't shut it behind her because then she's going to whine to get out. I, it's okay. If you make noise, this is real life. It's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. One, I think that's, what's great is, you know, it's always good to share what real people are saying and yeah. how it flows and everything. I thank you for asking me. It's, been an honor and I enjoy it. Welcome. 
So thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us as we spread awareness through our personal stories and the many resources shared. You can help us by joining our village simply by sharing our show to the masses. If you would like to support the Gilbo Girls on another level, click on the link in the show notes to make a donation in any amount. Add your address and you'll receive a hand stamped token with the word village on it in appreciation. Be sure to subscribe to our Gilbo Girls podcast and YouTube show. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Gilbo Girls. Till next time.